Hey everybody, um, alright, so we're continuing and probably finishing chapter 7 today. Um, and like I've done in the last couple lectures, I'll, I'll do a quick review of a couple of the key topics from the last lecture, the, sort of the ending part. A big one was that uh, when you have the E2 reaction, which makes alkenes through a base mediated um, elimination, so we make alkenes using bases. There were uh, these substrate effects where where you have sometimes you have an E2 reaction, sometimes you, sometimes you have an SN2 reaction. And I just wanted to review that real quick. Um, that kind of if you have a, a really small alkoxide base like methoxide or ethoxide or you know like one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, but like maybe a linear thing or just just a generally small alkoxide base you get one behavior, and if you have a larger one, the, the larger one we typically consider is terp-butoxide, like sodium terp-butoxide, you, or, you know, you can, all these can be sodium or potassium, um, you get a different behavior, okay? And um, this was the, this is a pretty cool summary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show another summary in a bit. Um, but basically showing that, like, you know, if you have if you have a tertiary substrate, either of these will always give you E2 elimination. If you have a secondary substrate, they also always give you an E2 sub elimination. E, sorry, yeah, E2 reaction elimination. They always make alkenes. Small alkoxide, large alkoxide. Always with the, give you E2 for tertiary and secondary. For primary, you have a gray area where the small ones actually undergo a nice SN2. So that means that the oxygen attacks the carbon, kicks off the leading group, and you get an SN2. Whereas the large alkoxide, like tert-butoxy, gives you an elimination, E2. And then for methyl, for methyl, where there's no neighboring proton, because remember the E2 reaction. With E2 reactions, you always take off a neighboring proton, right? Well, there's no neighboring proton on methyl, so you always get an SN2 for either of them, primary, uh, small ones and large ones. Also, last time I just showed some examples. I'm not going to re review them all, but but these are good to sort of emphasize these. Uh, substrate effects. So we showed like a tertiary, secondary, primary, and methyl, and then I was like, oh, well, what happens with the the uh, branched one, the big one? And we, we know that the only one that does SN2 is the uh, methyl case. And then for primary, secondary, and tertiary, it's like E2, 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 okay? And then for the same sets of substrates, and again, this is all from last time, tertiary, secondary, primary, and methyl, if we do a, a small alkoxides, small alkoxides, it goes E2, E2, SN2, SN2. E2, E2, SN2, SN2. Okay? So that, that's a really good summary. And, and we're going to see another summary sheet here in a second. Another thing we did last time was we started talking about the E2 reaction and uh, how, it, how it requires the hydrogen in the leaving group, because it, remember, it pulls off the hydrogen to kick off the leaving group next door. How the geometry has to be 180 degrees, and there's a name for that. It's called anti-periplanar, okay? All from last time, this is still review. Anti-periplanar just means 180 degrees, and we showed a couple examples of this. Um, like, oh, that hydrogen and that leaving group are not 180 degrees, they're actually like, you know, a zero degree angle, and there's no reaction but, and with the treatment of the base. But if it rotates around, okay, now the hydrogen is 180 degrees and it, it undergoes the reaction. So we showed that in kind of these sort of linear molecules. We also showed it in, a, in cases where it was like a cyclohexane. And with cyclohexanes, you have to draw it in chair form. And if the leaving group is equatorial, then there's no, there's never, ever, ever, ever an anti-periplanar anti proton. That's 180 degrees. So you always have to flip it so that the um, 
the leaving group is um, axial. And then when you under when you when it's axial, then there's all well there there can be antiperiplanar hydrogens. Why do I say can and like you know there always will be? Um, I mean like what I'm trying to say is like this proton on this side is not antiperiplanar to the bromine because this is going down and this is kind of going down to an angle, right? But but on this side we do have a hydrogen that's 180 degrees. So axial hydrogen, if you have an axial leaving group and you have an axial hydrogen, then it undergoes a nice E2 reaction to make the um, alkene, okay? Uh, this is just another example, I'm not gonna go through it, because I went through it last time, of like another cyclohexane type problem where where like you know one substrate get, undergoes a fast E2 reaction, the other does not, and then we sort of went through the analysis of uh, how that actually would happen. Like why does this give an E2? Why does this not? And there were some. Well, anyway, this is kind of one for you to try try doing yourself. Uh, and it was, I think, a homework problem also. So the, the key is in the solution guide. Okay, so now we're kind of at the this end part, which, which I'm going to call summary once more. And the, this is going to summarize kind of everything we've we've learned in terms of SN2 and uh, E2, SN1. Yeah, SN2, SN1, E2, and E1. All right, so let's do our little summary now. Um, number nine summary. once more because we already kind of summarized these things a few times so this is a little redundant that's okay four situations four situations that we've kind of encountered over the last two chapters weekly basic good nucleophile. And this is usually going to give you an SN2 reaction. This is usually going to be an SN2 reaction. This is really kind of last chapter, chapter 6. So, like, I don't know, here's a chiral secondary substrate, KCN, maybe DMF. All of this is um, Suggestive of an SN2 reaction. Good nucleophile, it's negatively charged, DMF, polaripodic solvent, and you would get the inverted SN2 product. Okay. Um, I'm going to emit mechanisms here because just for the interest of time. Let's try this one, and maybe like NaN3, another good SN2 nucleophile, sodium azide. We'll do acetone this time. Polar product solvent, etc. N3 works really good on, on secondary and primary substrates. Good leaving groups. Na plus S minus. These sulfur things with negative charges are good nucleophiles, and here you would get three carbons on the left, sulfur, one carbon, uh, sulfide, sulfide functional group, like that. Um, here's a primary with a bromide, and we'll do, remember, like SE, selenium. Selenium is also a good nucleophile, sulfur and selenium. Uh, they're polarizable because they're lower on the periodic table. Of course, this attacks, and maybe a DMF or something. And you guys know about that. Cool. All right. So that's situation one. Uh, the other situation is solvolysis. 
of secondary and tertiary alkyl halides, subolysis, so that's usually the SN1 reaction. That's the first thing we learned in chapter 7. It's a carbocation mechanism. Carbocation. Remember, carbocations uh, are definitely possible for tertiary. Less so for secondary, but they are possible. Primary and methyl, you'll never have a carbocation. Um, I don't know, let's try... Here's a good leaving group. It's a secondary. Terrible nucleophile methanol. And you would get a mixture of the... Um, of the uh, enantiomers. Sometimes I abbreviate this uh, like this racemic, it's a racemic mixture, right? A racemic mixture. And I, sometimes I just abbreviate that as this. So I don't show any stereochemistry at all, I just use a line. And that would kind of, that usually would imply a racemic mixture. So I could write this, I could write those. If it's a quiz, I might say, hey, please draw all of the enantiomers, well, the, the enantiomers, there's always only two enantiomers, and you would you would draw both of them. So, it kind of, on a quiz, it uh, kind of depends on what I ask you for. Okay, you always ask me. It also works wonderfully on tertiary. Let's try uh, propyl alcohol and Oops, sorry. Okay, I just drew it kind of swished around a little bit. But yeah, yeah, the bromine departs, oxygen attacks, and you get this. Now these are often E1 minor, so there's often a little bit of E1 as a minor product, E1 minor. So you might get, it's SN1 and E1 minor, right? So in this top case, the byproduct would be maybe that. So if the leaving group falls off, you get the alkene like that. Uh, all right, and I put it in parentheses to suggest it's minor. And then let's see, for this one, maybe the, the byproduct would be this propene. Okay, so that would be an E1 minor byproduct of this SN1 reaction. Okay, we're on the summary. So then we have the uh, strong bases. Alkoxides. Strong bases, uh, the alkoxides like uh, carbon, oxygen, negative. Uh, they usually give elimination. Usually give E2, elimination. They usually give E2 elimination reactions. Um, and occasionally substitution. But it really depends on the alkoxide. And also it depends on the substrate. So there's a lot of a lot of variations of the, the alkoxides and their, their behavior. So I'm not gonna go through all of them now, but I'll just show a couple. You know, tertiary substrate. If I use either a, a non-hindered or a hindered alkoxide, I'm using potassium arbitrarily, that would undergo E2. And that, that is consistent with what we told you. Um, so any of the, uh, the neighboring protons could be taken off. So maybe this one. 
these are all E2 reaction. All right? And secondary. Also E2. Right? As we said before. Now for primary, for primary, if you use a hindered alkoxide, like tripetoxide, it undergoes E2. But for primary, if you use a non-hindered alkoxide, it could be methyl, it could be ethyl, propyl, like, you know, unbranched, like either small or, you know, or linear alkoxide, then it undergoes SN2. And that was what we call a gray area. It's like, oh, that, that you know, this undergoes E2, this goes, undergoes SN2. So, a little bit of memorization or just, you know, have a good chart that shows this for guidance. And then, of course, if you have methyl, it doesn't matter. MEOK for methyl. Uh, it's always SN2. Even if it's a, this big branched alkoxide. Why, why does it undergo SN2? Because E2 is impossible because you don't have a neighboring proton next to the, the alcohol halide. Now, if I did methyl, if I did methoxy, the product would be different. If I used methyl iodide and methoxy, potassium methoxide, it would be carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, carbon, it would be dimethyl ether. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, just as a little side note, uh, this idea of making ethers, this idea of making ethers, because you're making an ether, right? Alkoxide plus alkyl halide makes an ether. has a name. I, I may have mentioned it before, but I'll uh, mention it again. I, I don't remember if I told you this. It's called the Williamson Ether Synthesis. It's called the Williamson Ether Synthesis. I guess we'll call this a magic word, too. It's more than one word. It's the Williamson Ether Synthesis. Um, if you want to, you know, as a magic word, if you just say Williamson, that's acceptable. But the Williamson Ether Synthesis refers to the construction of an ether, an ether, from an alkoxide and an alkyl halide or a, or a haloalkane like methyl iodide or you know so making ethers this is also a Williamson ether synthesis both of these are you know they're both examples of a Williamson ether synthesis which we're going to give a, a magic word to and if the magic word can either be Williamson ether synthesis or just Williamson whatever so the, the spelling is William S-O-N, Williamson. Okay, um, cool. Now do, now, do you always need to write the magic word on a quiz? Well, you just have to read the question. If I say you need the magic word, you need the magic word. If I, if I don't say you need the magic word, then if you don't put it down, you wouldn't get a point deduction. Just, just you know, have it ready, maybe highlight it in your notes, like, well, Williamson. And here and there, I'm going to give you other names, and those, those will be magic words as well. All right? So maybe highlight it or do something that you know in your in your notes to indicate the magic word. Okay. All right, and. Actually, so I said there's uh, four categories, right? I did my, my SN2, I did the solvolysis, I did the strong bases, usually use E2. Um, this, la this last example I did, I'm just going to call that the fourth category. So I'm just going to sneak in a little subheading for D. 
And so D is hindered strong basis due substitution. Hindered alkoxides, which are strong bases, due substitution. On methyl. Only. Only methyl. Okay. All right, so that's going to be the fourth category uh, of my, my four little categories here, um, which is there's a rare case where a hindered alkoxide will do an SN2, because it really does not like to do SN2, but elimination is out of the question. Okay, so hindered alkoxide uh, nucleophiles do substitution on methyl. Alright, so I'm going to show the little summary slide I made for Chapter 7. It's in the PowerPoint slides here. I did a slight update of this PowerPoint um, to the very end. So if you downloaded it, you might want to just download it again. The only thing I changed was the very last slide. So if you go down, uh, the very last slide is a cool little summary of the different mechanisms by which haloalkanes react. Okay? Um, all right, so let's. The best way to do this is is to just go left, to, left to right. So we're just going to go kind of looking at that left column, which shows uh, methyl, and this is a poor nucleophile base. This is the typical solvolysis type of reaction with water or alcohols. If you have methyl primary, secondary, or tertiary. Um, of course, we know that for the solvolysis, it works the best on tertiary. One more thing, it says boldface reactions are the most important, and that's probably, I think, a, that's a reasonable thing uh, for this course. You know, there, there's a lot of exceptions to these reactions, but for you guys as sort of beginners to organic chemistry, um, the boldface ones are maybe the most important. Um, anyway, so. Poor nucleophile base means solvolysis. It's an example of solvolysis. And it, it works really well on tertiary, like, like we said. It also works on secondary. It's a slow SN1. E1 is always a minor byproduct of those. Never happens on primary and methyl. Why, do they, why does solvolysis not work for primary and methyl? It's because of terrible carbocation stability. You don't have carbocation stability on primary and methyl. But secondary and tertiary you do, and tertiary is the best in terms of carbocation stability. All right, so what about the next column? Weakly basic good nucleophiles. So this is, this is for the most part, what we talked about with SN2 reactions, right? The weakly basic good nucleophiles. Um, these are good, good nucleophiles, and it's usually a kind of an SN2 style reaction. Um, and as we learned, and, you know, and the other thing that we often do to make good SN2 reactions is we use a polar aprotic solvent like DMF acetone or DMSO. Um, so as we go down methyl primary secondary, we see, oh yeah, SN2, SN2, all of the SN2, all of these are good SN2 reactions. Very occasionally will you get a reaction with these on tertiary. Um, it's usually no reaction. Um, it's definitely never an SN2 reaction. You can never do an SN2 reaction on a tertiary because of the the hindered nature on a tertiary carbon. Okay, so in rare cases though you will see SN1 reactions. Um, we, we've talked about that like with the nitromethane solvent, nitromethane. So nitromethane, nitromethane, it's CH3, <coughs> CH3 and NO2, CH3 NO2, nitromethane. <coughs> we, we, we do occasionally see SN1 reactions on tertiary with these kind of good nucleophiles. But for the most part, SN2 reaction is what we usually see here, and it works best on primary, uh, methyl primary and secondary, okay? And then we have the strongly basic unhindered nucleophiles. 
unhindered nucleophiles. So that could be methoxy, it could be ethoxy, or like propoxy, like one carbon, two carbon, three carbon oxygen. And just like we said, for methyl, um, of course, it'll always be SN2 uh, because um, you can't do elimination on methyl ever. It's impossible, right? There's no extra hydrogen or extra carbon with another hydrogen. The other thing, though, is for these strongly basic unhindered nucleophiles, if it's pri if the substrate's primary, you get an SN2 reaction, okay? And for secondary and tertiary, you, you always get elimination. Elimination, elimination. Um, as we go to the strongly basic hindered nucleophiles like tert-butoxy, then methyl, which is the top one, is SN2. Then it's elimination, elimination, elimination. So there's a maybe a gray area if you consider uh, this this column of like, you know, if it's hindered, uh, unhindered nucleophile it gives you SN2 on primary. If it's a hindered nucleophile gives you E2 on primary. So that's like a, we'll say a major gray area. And, you know, that, remember if you're taking the class when we're giving exams, you actually actually have to memorize these things. And in the remote learning version of this course, you get this chart. I would recommend printing this chart and being familiar with it, and it'll, it'll really help you when you're trying to figure out which reaction each of these uh, does, okay? For the, the different situations and the different kinds of reaction mechanisms. For the most part, though, like E1, is we, for now, we just consider a byproduct of the SN1 reaction. So it's, right now, you don't think of E1 as something that just happens by itself. We will see cases, though, later where E1 happens all by itself. And uh, anyway, we'll talk about those later. Hey everybody, all right, so we're done with chapter seven and we're moving on, moving on to chapter eight, which has to do with the uh, hydroxy group, or we, we often call it the alcohol functional group. Um, as with a lot of the slides, almost like from now till the end of organic two, uh, we, we'll often deal with functional groups. And this is like a, a first pretty intense functional group chapter where we learn all about the alcohol functional group and uh, the reactivity and the nomenclature, the naming, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and, uh, and for most of these chapters, I, I'll have this idea of like a, a conceptual ideas PowerPoint where we, we talk about the, um, the kind of concepts and the na nomenclature, naming, all that kind of stuff. And then we go into all the reactions and mechanisms. And th those work best with this sort of uh, video recorded, uh, um, uh, you know, with my camcorder, uh, with the, in a sort of like a whiteboard type format. So we'll get to that in a, shortly. But for now, let's talk about some of the conceptual ideas. Now, these are some examples of alcohols that you're familiar with, methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, uh, ergosterol is a, among many kind of uh, biologically active uh, steroids. It's a, it's a vitamin precursor to vitamin D2. Sorry, biological precursor to vitamin D2. So it's a, and steroids always have this shape of the six member ring, six member ring, six member ring, five member ring. Sometimes you have different stuff up here, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of steroids. This is one of them. Um, there's a lot of biologically active, pharmacologically active alcohols. Uh, codeine is one of them. It has a hydroxy group there. Um, we've seen this when we talked about stereochemistry, you know, code, codeine, morphine, and other uh, opioid type derivatives. Um, Delta 9 THC or tetrahydrocannabinol has a pretty cool structure. It's got a couple rings. There's a benzene. There's a couple six member rings. This molecule, um, and, then, and then there's a sort of random six carbon chain attached to it also. This is uh, 
an example of a phenol, an aromatic alcohol, which is a phenol. So there's a, if you have a benzene with a hydroxy group, it, it's not only is it an alcohol, it's an aromatic alcohol or a phenol, okay? All right, so some of the naming, and, and the, this is stuff that you could maybe see on a, an upcoming quiz. Um, there's a standard procedure we use we, for, to name alcohols. We find the longest chain in the molecule containing the alcohol. We find the longest chain. And then, like, this is kind of like how we name anything, <laughs> right? We always find the longest, longest, longest chain first. And then the name, rather than be like blah, 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 ain, like, like hexane or something, it'll be blah, 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 anol, like hexanol. Hexane becomes hexanol. Um, number the clo number closest to the end containing the alcohol. That's the rule, and then we alphabetize the substituents kind of as usual. All right, so two bromo, three methyl butanol. How do we take this name and convert it to a structure? Um, so probably uh, I always look at kind of the right side of the name first, butanol, and uh, I think of oh, it's a four carbon alcohol. Where is the alcohol, though? Because if we don't specify it, it might be on carbon number one. So it's, it's you know, if you don't specify the location of the alcohol, you would uh, assume it's in carbon one. And uh, so it's going to be a butanol, four carbons with a hydroxy on one, two bromo, three methyl. All right, so this would be the, uh, the one way we could draw this. Two bromo, three methyl, butanol. Okay. Now, if you want to specify the location of the alcohol, you, you would sneak it in right between the L and the B. It would be like, you could say like 2-bromo-3-methyl-2-butanol, right? 2-bromo-3-methyl-2-butanol. That would put the alcohol on carbon number 2. Okay, so uh, how do we name this molecule? How do we, given the structure, how do we name it? Well, find the 4-carbon piece with the uh, counting beginning on the end closer to the alcohol, so one, two, three, four. All right, it looks to me like three bromo, two butanol. Three bromo, two butanol, yeah. Three bromo, two butanol. And this is where we spec an example where we specify the location of the alcohol on the chain. Hmm, how do you think we're gonna do this? Now I helped you out by showing the numbering, you know, number at the end closer to the alcohol. So it looks like it's going to be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like a hexanol, right? It's going to be maybe a 3 hexanol because the alcohol is in 3. It's going to be blah, 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 3 hexanol, blah, 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 3 hexanol. And so then we think about the substituents and it looks like we have 3 methyls, 2 on carbon 2 and 1 on 5. How do, you, how do you write that? How do you write there's three methyls, two on two and one on five, and then three hexanol. It's gonna be two, two, five, trimethyl, three hexanol. Two, two, five, trimethyl, three hexanol. Two, two, five, trimethyl, three hexanol. Oh boy, now we have, how do we deal with stereochemistry? Um, so if it's if it's a stereochemistry type question, you're you're gonna have to add the R's and S's to the beginning. And so if we ignore the stereochemistry, it looks like it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six. It's gonna be uh, three hexanol, right? Because we number closer to the OH always. The the OH has the priority, so it's three hexanol, four bromo, three hexanol, four bromo, three hexanol, and then you'd so there's the hexanol. It's 4-bromo-3-hexanol. And if we want to specify the chirality, you would then write like 3R4S, 4-bromo-3-hexanol. The, here it's like we write 4-bromo-3-hexanol because this is a substituent and then the hexanol is part of the alcohol chain. That's why it's like 4-bromo-3-hexanol. But when we do the chirality, it's always, you, you, you always use the the position, so like 3R4S. And is it 3R4S? You'd use your maybe thumb method or something. Uh, I am looking at carbon 3, which is the alcohol, and I see R, yeah, right hand R. Th alcohol is definitely 3R. 
Let's try the bromine, point my thumb towards myself, and I see S. So th yeah, 3R4S, very cool. That matches. Okay, so what about this kind of situation? Um, so if you have a, uh, a cyclo um, alkane with an alcohol on it, the, the position of the alcohol will be carbon number one. So I think it'll be cyclopentanol. Cyclopentanol just refers to a cyclopentane with an alcohol, cyclopentanol. And on carbon, where are the methyls? If this is carbon one, where the alcohol is, this will be carbon two. So it'd be one, two, dimethyl, cyclopentanol. One, two, dimethyl, cyclopentanol. All right, what about this one? Um, well, it looks like it's cyclohexanol, cyclo hexanol with a methyl at the four position. So maybe it's four methyl cyclohexanol. Four methyl cyclohexanol. One, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. Four methyl cyclohexanol. Is there an R and S associated with this? Um, well these are not chiral centers, so it can't be R and S. But how would you maybe represent the stereochemistry? Uh, in this situation on rings, you usually would use cis and trans, and, and, and d this does not look like cis, it looks like trans. So I think it's going to be trans 4-methyl cyclohexanol. Trans, because it's trans, 4-methyl cyclohexanol. Trans 4-methyl cyclohexanol. You always put the trans in the, in the front. Okay, and these are just uh, some of those other kind of miscellaneous phenols, or sorry, alcohols. This is phenol, a benzene, uh, aromatic alcohol, phenol, okay? Uh, this one, though, is, is just kind of mentioned because we're going to see this pattern through the end of organic, too. It's called benzyl alcohol, phenyl CH2 alcohol. So when you have a, f a benzene and a CH2 group, it's called benzyl. So in a way, uh, you you know, it's not totally obvious. Oh, th you know, benzyl alcohol refers to this molecule. Well, you should remember maybe, and you know, it's hard to memorize little trivia, but the definition of benzyl, the definition of benzyl, we, d we can define the word benzyl as a benzene and a CH2. So the definition of benzyl is benzene, CH2. So what is benzyl bromide? What do you think benzyl bromide would be? Benzyl bromide would be phenyl CH2 bromide, BR. Okay, so the definition of benzyl, that's what it is. Um, all right, so what if you have like two alcohols on a molecule? Okay, it looks like it's, how many carbons do we have? One, two, three, four. So when you have like two alcohols, the naming is, is just, it has a funny naming. It's, it's going to be uh, butane, it's going to be a butane diol. Butane diol. So there's the butane and it's a dialcohol on carbon 1 and 2. So it'd be 1, 2 butane diol. 1, two, one two butane diol. Uh, classifying alcohols, so a methyl, uh, methyl is all, CH3. A primary alcohol would be a, an alcohol where you have a carbon with one thing on it. So that's, that's called primary carbon, primary alcohol. What do you think a secondary alcohol would be? Well, that's a, an alcohol where the carbon is connected to two things, right? Secondary alcohol. Would it be a tertiary alcohol? It's an alcohol where the carbon is connected to three things. So that's kind of obvious. It's, you know, we have to mention it because you, you haven't seen that before. But that's the, that's the kind of classification system of alcohols. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to the structure and properties of alcohols. Uh, in a lot of ways, the alcohols kind of resemble water. It's kind of like an organic version of water. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, so if we think about water, it's roughly tetrahedral. Why is it tetrahedral? Because remember, there's two lone pairs um, on water, and um, Roughly sp3, but it, there's some question if water is actually sp3. Uh, but uh, methanol is an example of a of a um, simple alcohol. 
And of course, the carbon is sp3, and everything's roughly 109. The oxygen in alcohol is roughly 109, so it's roughly tetrahedral. And then we have the random bond lengths and stuff like that, um, uh, which are just kind of normal, normal uh, bonds that you might expect between like an oxygen and a hydrogen. Methoxymethane is an ether. So ether is not a, not an alcohol. It's a carbon, oxygen, carbon. And so it's also roughly tetrahedral, too. The oxygen is roughly tetrahedral, So because it also has two lone pairs on it. All atoms are sp3. Water is questionably sp3. I think people say it's unhybridized. Um, we talked about that, I think, in chapter 2 or something. Uh, the textbook also talks about how water is not it's, it's arguably not hybridized at all, but you can kind of think of it as kind of semi sp3 hybridized, and the bond angles are roughly tetrahedral. Yeah, yeah, roughly tetrahedral. Uh, alcohols have a higher boiling point than hydrocarbons. Why do you think that might be? Why why do you think an alcohol actually boils cl like closer to water or something like that? What would possibly enhance the boiling point of uh, an alcohol? So it's totally due to hydrogen bonding. So if you have alcohols or hydrogen bound to other alcohols or hydrogen bound to other alcohols, all of these are sort of attractive interactions between like the oxygen and the hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a, uh, that is a uh, intermolecular interaction and it causes an increase in boiling points. So you think about like methanol and the boiling point 65 degrees. Um, this has a bunch of information. Right now we're just looking really at the boiling point. So methanol, ethanol is a higher boiling point, right? It's 78 roughly. And then propanol has like 97. It's a, a, even a higher boiling point. All of these are dissolve very readily in water because they also hydrogen bond and dissolve with water. Butanol, higher boiling point. So that makes sense. As you increase the number of carbons, you get a higher boiling point. Pentanol is even higher. As it, why, 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 when you add extra carbons, though, one carbon, two carbon, three, four, five, do you have more of a boiling point? That has to do with the kind of Van der Waals interactions and how the uh, alcohols, with the larger alcohols, they kind of stack on top of each other. And that... Um, and that that increases the boiling point also a little bit. Okay, so that's kind of a Van der Waal interaction as you as you increase the number of carbons. All right. Um, okay. So this this is a pretty cool little thing. If you compare like butanol, one butanol versus two butanol versus chert butanol, or it'd be another. What's the systematic name of this? If you if you're not using chert butanol, you could say it looks like 2-methyl-2-propanol, uh, two two right? 2-methyl-2-propanol two would be this, or, or it's called tert-butanol. Why do we have a boiling point change here? Um, so as for these kind of linear-looking alcohols, um, they have higher boiling points, right? Why do they have higher higher boiling points? It's the Van der Waals interactions, right? There's kind of a stacking of the one alcohol and another, another, and that has a little bit of a, you know, induced dipole effect and things like that, and that increases the boiling point of a uh, linear alcohol. When you have starting introducing branching, and this is like a, a little bit of branching, and this is a whole bunch of branching, then the alcohol is kind of like a I like to say like a greasy ball. <laughs> and you have a couple greasy balls. They can't really interact very effectively the way that li you know linear molecules can. And that's why we have a boiling point uh, difference between linear, partially branched, and uh, very branched, like terbutanol. So branched alcohols have lower boiling points, and that's due to uh, the linear ones having more like Van der Waals interactions. Acidity and basicity. Okay, so 
the acidity of alcohols is similar to water, and that's expected. Remember, we, we also called, we gave this a name. If it's an RO minus thing, it's called an alkoxide. Um, and, re, you know, we're not going to review the definition of pKa too, too extensively, but just, just to show you, you know, remind you from Gen Chem, uh, of course, this reaction has an e, uh, equilibrium constant, products of reactants. Ka is like a variation of this, where uh, it's it's K times H2O, so H2O falls out of, out, and it's basically just H3O times the uh, the uh, conjugate base divided by the uh, alcohol. And if you take pKa, it's a negative log ten of that. Okay, all right. But the main thing we know know is low pKa's are highly acidic, high pKa's are less acidic. Uh, this just shows a couple alcohols. Um, let's kind of look on the left first. That methanol is roughly the same as water in terms of acidity. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, the structure of methanol and the structure of water are pretty similar. Ethanol is actually pretty similar also. There's not much of a difference between methanol and ethanol. Um, the, but interestingly, the branched ones, as you start introducing branching, the uh, pKa actually goes up. Does that make it more acidic or less acidic? More acidic or less? Well, if it's larger pKa, it's a little less acidic. And tert-butanol, this is tert-butanol, or we call it 2-methyl-2-propanol, uh, is even a uh, higher pKa, so it's even less acidic. The other interesting thing is that if you have halogens, uh, if you have halogens, um, you start seeing reduced pKa values. So like this is trifluoroethanol, trifluoroethanol versus trifluoropropanol versus trifluorobutanol. If you have a CF3 kind of nearby, the pKa drops. Is that more acidic or less acidic? It's more acidic, right? Um, there's also this kind of chlorine case. I'm going to kind of focus on the bottom ones because they you're ke keeping one thing constant and it's just easier to look at. The other thing um, is that it, you know, if you have this CF3 and it, it drops the pKa and makes it more acidic, it's distance dependent, right? Because if we just add an extra carbon, oh, it's a little bit less prominent of an effect. Add an extra carbon, oh, it's even less prominent. So there's this kind of uh, distance effect. Distance effect. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a second too. So branched are kind of less acidic, and then these halogen substituted are uh, more acidic, um, although it's distance dependent. So the, the the biggest effect is if the CF3 or whatever is uh, really close to the alcohol. Why are alcohols acidic at all? You know, compared to like an uh, alkane or something that's totally non-acidic. Um, so, what feature stabilizes the conjugate base of these three things? So, like a carboxylic acid is a fairly acidic thing. It's four point eight. Alcohol, we're calling, you know, it's, it's somewhat acidic. It's not like as, as acidic as a carboxylic acid. And then like a haloalkane, or sorry, a uh, alkane is like hugely non-acidic, right? Um, so what are the features that stabilize the conjugate base? And especially like why is this so stabilized? Well, that's pretty easy. When you lose the proton, you have a resonance stabilized conjugate base. A resonance stabilized conjugate base. Resonance is incredibly stabilizing. Remember that? Resonance is st incredibly stabilizing. This is not resonance stabilized. There's no resonance here. But you do have um, electronegativity. So the oxygen is stabilized by electronegativity. Electronega this is completely non-stabilized. And that's why the pKa is so high. And you know, if you think about acidity um, in, in the pKa scale is logarithmic, this is 35, 10 to the 35 times, 10 to the 35 times less acidic than this. So that's like a 1 followed by 35 zeros, right? This is like a very good example of a non-acidic proton. But this is uh, due to electronegativity. So there we have resonance stabilization. Uh, 
some kind of electronegativity, and then absolutely no source of stabilization. The left one also has an electronegativity of the oxygen, and that's why it, it's a relatively stable functional group, it's a relatively stable conjugate base, sorry, and a relatively acidic, acidic. And this is the other thing about acidity. When we think about acidity, you know, what, um, when you think about acidity of things in organic chemistry, you should always think about the the st anything that stabilizes the conjugate base. That's a, that's a huge, huge, huge thing in organic chemistry. It's like, you know, if I, if I ask you, why is this acidic? The totally wrong answer will be, oh, resonance. Resonance, 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 resonance. That is the totally wrong answer. You, you don't say, oh, resonance. The answer is resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. That's what you say. Where here it's like, you know, stabilization of the conjugate base by electronegativity. It's always something about the conjugate base that causes acidity. Okay. Why are branched alcohols less acidic than linear alcohols? Why are branched alcohols less acidic than linear alcohols? Branched alcohols prevent solvation of the conjugate base. Okay. So if you introduce branching, like tert-butanol or sec-butanol, um, you have branching and that prevents solvation of the conjugate base. If the conjugate base is not solvated properly with solvent, it uh, is less happy. It's less happy. So here's a good example. Here's methanol. Nice, relatively acidic pKa of, among alcohols, you know. What if we add a bunch of CH3s around here? Well, then the solvent is less effective because it can't really get in there to do all this great solvation. And so when we think about tert butanol, which has a higher pKa, it's less acidic. So now, now less solvent can sneak in there and uh, have that positive effect. That's the easiest explanation for why a branched alcohol is less acidic than a unbranched alcohol, like a linear or a kind of small alcohol. Okay, more solvation, more stable, less solvation, less stable. So you always kind of again, just as, just like before, you don't think about the, like the nature of the alcohol. You think about the nature of the conjugate base and what stabilizes the conjugate base or destabilizes it or something. Why are halogen substituted alcohols more acidic? So why, when I, if, I, if I compare ethanol to trifluoroethanol, do I see a massive increase in acidity on the right? Like it's, it's you know, remember this is logarithmic, so the acidity is not like, you know, a difference of three, you know, three times acidic or something like that. It's, the difference is 10 to the, the three, right? So it's roughly, a thousand. This is a thousand times more acidic. A thousand times more acidic than that because it's it's uh, it's logarithmic. Um, okay, so you th the way you think about this is you never think about the alcohol and what stabilizes or makes the alcohol happy. You think about the conjugate base. So we draw the ethoxy and we draw the trifluoroethoxy. There is this thing, this little arrow. What this is is it's showing negative charge delocalized. So there's a delocalization. The negative charge is delocalized through the molecule to the trifluoro, right? Because these are all delta negative. All the fluorines are delta negative. That's weird. How does it do that? How, how can you delocalize electrons? How do you delocalize electrons? Well, you know one way, which is resonance, right? This is not resonance, though, because you, you're not... Resonance, you're always making and breaking double bonds. There's no double bonds to make or break here. This is not resonance. It's another word. It's called induction. Induction refers to the transmission of a charge through the sigma bonding network, which is like the single bonds, not the double bonds, right? Okay, so the conjugate base of the halogen substituted alcohol is stabilized by induction, transmission of electrons through the sigma bonding system. The effect is dependent on the number of halogens, and we have like three of them, so three fluorines, and the distance. So if the distance is greater, the effect is dissipated. 
This is distinct from resonance, which is transmission of electrons through the pi electron system. So there's kind of like two ways for you guys to transmit electron density. Induction, which is kind of through the sigma network, and resonance, which is through the pi electron system. And so this shows it again. And so if we have like the tr a trifluoromethyl kind of close, we have a very substantial effect and a, a massive increase in acidity. And that's due to induction stabilization of the conjugate base. And if the trifluoromethyl is a little further, it's 4.2.6. If it's further, it's um, even uh, less substantial, OK? So it's a distance dependent thing. Chlorine in this case is roughly equivalent to trifluoromethyl. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, do, uh, this is trifluoromethyl with th three carbons total. I would say, like, you know, th this is not that in not as exciting because we don't see the effect of like you know different distances of w between chlorine. I would say I would look at these bottom three ones just to see a nice distance distance effect. Comparing these guys is kind of like apples and oranges, and I don't think that's that big of a deal. Notice, notice the distance def distance effects. Induction stabilization can occur through a couple of carbon atoms. That's true. Resonance stabilization cannot do that. Re remember, resonance stabilization is only through the resonance structures we can draw. It can't go through multiple carbons unless you actually have double bonds that you can resonate around through multiple double bonds. Alcohols are amphoteric, so they can be acidic and also basic. So if you consider an alcohol, if you consider an alcohol, um, it can either lose its proton to become an alkoxide, or so if a base takes off the proton, it can actually uh, become an alkoxide, which we saw these being used in eliminations and some substitutions and stuff. But an alcohol can also grab a proton. And under acidic conditions, it can actually become protonated. So that's kind of a, a unique thing of alcohols. And this is an interesting thing um, of what, you know, what, what you, could, you could possibly do in terms of a chemical reaction um, that utilizes this ability of an alcohol to be protonated, right? Because if an alcohol can be protonated, maybe you can do something with it and you do a reaction. And yes, you can. I think this is chapter eight. Maybe next, maybe next chapter, chapter nine. Um, maybe this chapter, I can't remember. But um, protonation of alcohols can be used in the chemical reaction. So, an alcohol can react with HBr to make a tertiary bromide, a ter like a tertiary alcohol. The thing about this, though, is OH is a terrible leaving group. OH is a horrible leaving group. If you look in our leaving group chart, it's among the kind of bad ones, right? So how could this possibly come off as a leaving group? Oh, we have acid around. So the alcohol can grab the proton, right, and then become an H2O. And then H2O is actually a good leaving group. So something like this. So the oxygen would grab the proton, kick off the Br, and now you have a good leaving group. Oh, the leaving group goes away. Oh, now you have a carbocation. Oh, Br attacks. So these kind of things can start happening, and, and we'll talk about this more as we go along. But this is a nice preview of some of the fun stuff that's up and coming for us. Synthetic deprotonation of, an, of alcohols. Sometimes we need to deprotonate alcohols in the course of, a, of carrying out a chemical reaction. And this is another thing that we're we're kind of kind of previewing because we're not quite there, but we know enough about it now to to do that. So simply use a strong base. If you want to make an alkoxide from an alcohol, you just use a strong base, and the equilibrium goes away from the stronger acid. Remember this. So here's an example. Um, if I have an alcohol like ethanol, ethanol, that's ethanol, pK is 15.9, and I react this with a, a pretty strong base. This is called sodium amide in a NH2. Um, uh, well, so let's just draw the equilibrium out. There, there, I show the mechanism too, but that's not that exciting. 
So we have acid base makes base plus acid. Which direction does this equilibrium go? Is this a kind of a right favored equilibrium or a left favored equilibrium? So the equilibrium goes away from the stronger acid, and, and in this case, the stronger acid is the um, the ethanol, right? Because it's got a smaller pKa. The other way to, to to remember this is that the equilibrium goes towards the larger pKa value. So 15.9. Oh, it goes towards 35. So I just show that as like, oh yeah, it goes to the right. You know, arrow, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And why does why would you want to do this? Well, remember what are the fun things we can do with with alkoxides? Oh, we just learned. SN2 reactions. What's the, the something ether synthesis? It's a, the something ether synthesis. Remember that? It begins with W. The Williamson ether synthesis was a way to make ethers. and But it requires you to have an alkoxide. You can't just make ethers with alcohols. You got to have an alcohol, convert it to an alkoxide, or I just showed the alkoxide already pre made. But once you got the alkoxide, it can be used to make an ether. Um, here's another example. Uh, alcohol. This is one of these things I call a super base. This is a super, super, super base. How do you know it's a super base? You can't just look at it and say, oh, it's, it looks very basic to me. You always consider, when you're considering the basicity of something, you consider the conjugate acid of it. And the conjugate acid of Na plus H minus is call is H2, right? And the pKa is a very big number, <laughs> right? That's why I say, oh yeah, yeah, it's a super base. Anyway, so another equilibrium. It's like H minus takes the proton and kicks it off and makes an alkoxide. This is an amazingly good way to make alkoxides. Just take an alcohol and react with NaH. Okay? You make H2. H2 is flammable, so you have to be a little careful because this could catch on fire if you're kind of reckless about it. <laughs> It also generates some heat, so you generate heat, you generate H2. If you have a, if you're having a bad day, it's going to catch on fire. So usually you have some ice around and and just do this kind of cautiously and slowly. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's another equilibrium. This is how you make alkoxides. So there's other other ways to make alkoxides too, but these are great ways to make alkoxides. Why would you want to deprotonate alcohol? and to maybe do something useful. Well, to activate it as an SN2 nucleophile, right? Activate the oxygen as an SN2 nucleophile. That's exactly what we did in that last chapter, the end. We talked about those cool SN2 reactions we can do with alkoxides. And again, the something ether synthesis begins with W. It's the Williamson ether synth synthesis. So here's an example. I want to make an ether. Okay, I got an alcohol. How do I make this ether? I use NaH, super base, rips off the proton, makes an O minus Na plus. Then I do a nice SN2 reaction with a bromide or something and DMF, polar ray product solvent, beautiful SN2 reaction. Okay. Um, remember, though, that there are restrictions on making ethers with alkoxides. So if this is either if either this is branched or this is branched, you got starting to have, start having problems. So this really works well if you have like a primary on this side or primary on that side. Another example. Alcohol NaNH2 superbase. We'll use iodomethane DMSO. Beautiful SN2 reaction. Um, but but, 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 you might say, oh, but this is branched. This is a bad, kind of a bad SN2 nucleophile. Even if you, even if you take off that proton and make an O minus, it's kind of, it, it's, it's trouble in an SN2 reaction because the nucleophile is so important. So normally when you have a branched alkoxide, uh, you know, after you take off the proton, it's going to be, it doesn't want to do SN2. It wants to do E2. Remember that? how branched alkoxides want them to do E2 reactions. But the only thing that the reason this works is because you're using <laughs> methyl iodide, which cannot undergo E2. It can only undergo SN2, right? So this is an example of a, you know, it, it works as an SN2 just because E2 is out of the question. 
you know, this is all last chapter, but it's cool to see it in a real example. The mechanism of the of these is really easy. You should be able to do the mechanism. Base takes proton, and then you got an alkoxide, and it kicks off the leaving group, SN2. You would draw this as a two-step process. You don't try to draw it as one step. Sometimes you can get away with a weak base. This is interesting. Sometimes you can get away with a weak base. Um, what does that mean? So you don't necessarily need to use a super base. This is just an example. If I have alcohol and NaOH, the equilibrium uh, forms, and you, th this makes the alkoxide and water. Well, the equilibrium is not exactly left favored or right favored. It's kind of K equals one, right? It's going to be sort of like a half and half, a 50% equilibrium, roughly, right? But the thing is, this is actually a good nucleophile. This is a good nucleophile, and so you could, um, you could theoretically do an SN2 reaction on, on like uh, ethyl bromide, and then you'd made propyl ethyl ether. It's kind of like a Williamson um, type product. So, so sometimes you can get away with a weak base and do this. Generally speaking, though, you just use a super base. Use NaH or NaNH2, and, and it works quantitatively. Why is phenol more acidic than alcohol? alcohol? Why, what makes this a more acidic alcohol? Hmm, what, what could possibly make it more acidic? Well, you see the benzene, and then the, the, the naive student's going to say, resonance, resonance, resonance. And that's wrong, right? You don't just say resonance, because you always have to think about the what. It's not the, you don't look at the alcohol when you determine acidity. You think about the what, the something base, the, the conjugate base, right? You think about what happens when this gets deprotonated, what happens when this gets deprotonated. Draw the conjugate base, and then you talk about things that stabilize it. So when you take, when you, uh, when methanol gets deprotonated, oh yeah, this has some, a little bit of electronegativity, it's stabilized by electronegativity. This conjugate base has a bunch of resonance. So it's all about resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base, et cetera, et cetera. You fill in all the arrows and all the resonance structures. That is what makes this more acidic. It's not, the answer is not just resonance, because that's, that's an incomplete answer. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Say it a thousand times right now. I think we're done with this. In addition to resonance, there's also induction. So there is a little bit of a, of a kind of a negative charge transmission. Um, there's another way to, to explain this. Um, I'm not going to get into that. I think that re resonance is the easiest way to visualize this. There are some debates about whether it's really resonance or induction. Um, and I can talk to, to you about that in office hours if you, if you want to. You know, resonance, though, that's a, that's a, that's great, and it also it also um, kind of aligns with what you've learned in this class. We have a consistent theme of of resonance stabilization of the conjugate base, explaining a lot of acidity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is the end of the PowerPoint. I guess we're going to jump into the whiteboard presentation, or you know, my my video camera pseudo whiteboard presentation of all the reactions and behavior of alcohols uh, starting next time. All right, so see you next time.